Today our scripture reading um, will be found in John 2, verses 16 to 19. To those who sold, to those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remember that it is written, seal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responding to him, what signs can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered to them, destroy the temple and I will raise it again in three days. Amen. Sometimes your communications come across. Sometimes they don't. The text today was going to come out of John 3. However, because of what we're doing this month, where first it was Eric who said, let's look at H-E-A-R-T and three words each week, beginning with the letter of the appropriate front end. And so we have. And now I have an input from my friend Amy, who just read to you the text that actually stirs my soul so much. When I think of Jesus, and I think of his heart, and I think of how he felt about people, especially people who were not Jewish. So if you are not Jewish today, I hope that your heart was stirred by the text that you just heard because what happened in that moment was that Jesus threw the, 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 the money changers out of the court of the Gentiles. Does that, does that make you feel good? That there was a plan for the court, uh, the temple, to have a place for people who were not of Jewish ancestry who were not heretofore invited to come into the presence of God, and so they built a court specifically for people who were not biologically Jewish. But the people of that day, the people of that day had decided that they wanted to make money on the worshipers, the Jewish worshipers who came to church. And so they would ask them to give their tithes in the currency of the temple only. So they had to come to the money changer with their regular shekel and change it into the temple shekel. And of course, there was money made in the exchange, don't you know? And they also brought their sheep for their sacrifice, and, 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 and their sheep was never good enough. Though they thought it was a spotless one-year-old male lamb, they were told it was not spotless. It had a blemish and therefore had to be exchanged for another one that was deemed spotless and therefore good enough. And, of course, money was made in that exchange as well. So I'm hoping <laughs> that you feel about that text like I feel about my church because I am interested, as I said to one of our dear young people today, I am interested in knowing if doing this thing that we do on Sabbath mornings is helping your spirituality, yeah. is helping your connection with Jesus. Because if it's not... I want to hear from you, okay? And I want to hear from you because I want to know that you are interested in knowing Jesus because that's what he did that day. He stood up, and some people think he made a whip and that he was beating people. No! I'm an African. I understand these things. You know the African chief standing there with that thing that looks like a fly swatter? That is not a fly swatter. That is a diadem. That is as much an, a, a symbol of his power and authority as was the whip that Jesus made out of cords and held. And if you read Ellen White, she says the divinity flashed through humanity and that's what they ran from. So, thanks, Amy. Thanks for letting us read John chapter 2, because John chapter 2 comes before John chapter 3. So turn over the, the page and go to John chapter 3, and you find there the story of a guy named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is, is, a, is a good friend of mine, 
<laughs> because I, I grew up a lot like Nicodemus, and I went to school like Nicodemus, and, and uh, there were times in my life when people thought that I should be certain things and do certain things, and, and that was because they thought that that was the right thing for me to do within the church. And as I have, have done a lot of those things, I have also found that maybe, maybe, just maybe, I need to look for Jesus all by myself. So Nicodemus decides that even though he is a closet Jesus supporter, he is going to come out of the closet at night under cover of darkness, <laughs> which is so ironic because of what Jesus says later on in chapter 3 about the light. He comes in darkness and he says these things. Thank God I remembered my glasses this morning. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin. He came to Jesus at night, this I've already said, and he said these incredible words, Rabbi, teacher, Rabboni, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. Who's the we? Nicodemus. This is the Sanhedrin. This is the people that are leading the people. We know that you are from God. For no one, okay, this is, this is now his testimony, and he's giving it on behalf of the Sanhedrin, uh, in front of whom Jesus is arraigned in just a few short months. We know that you are from God, for no one can perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In the arrangement of the, the series this month, we are dealing with heart of God and H-E-A-R-T. So you are lucky enough to have come today on the E day, the E of heart. And so we're dealing with three important words. We're going to deal with energy. We're going to deal with everybody, and we're going to deal with excellence or excellent. The three words come from the story here of Nicodemus, who was looking to have an interview, which I like to call Nick at night. He was looking for an interview with Yeshua of Nazareth, Nazareth. And in this first few verses of John chapter 3, we find him looking for the one, the one, okay, the one. Which, which one? Okay, so I need to take you back to uh, the, the, the other th third chapter, and that's the third chapter of Genesis. Because if you want to know who the one was, you've got to go back to the very beginning, and you've got to ask who is the one that he is looking for, because it is the same one that Eve was also looking for. John, uh, uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 says, I, this is now God speaking, he is now speaking to Adam and Eve after they have decided not to trust him. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and the offspring and hers. He, Eve, he, the one, will crush your serpent, your head, and you will strike his heel, snake. It will not be a completely death-inducing death, death blow, but it will be extremely painful. Extremely painful. And if you look into the eyes of Mary, like Jesus did as he was hanging on the cross, the only thing he could think to do at that moment was to say to his, his cousin John, she is now your mother. I want you to take care of her like she was your mother. Even though she's your aunt, I want you to take care of her like she's your mother. The pain of that moment is incalculable. But this is the one, this is the one that Nicodemus is also looking for, and he feels 
he knows, he says, that he has found him. In reply, Jesus declares, I tell you the truth, no one can come to see, can, can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. He is delving straight in, he is diving straight in to the very heart of what Nicodemus believes as a Pharisee in Israel at that time, that they were the kingdom of God. I was raised in this church and I got the distinct impression that being one of us was also the kingdom of God. So if you're relating to Nicodemus like I'm relating to Nicodemus, you, you may want to hang on to your seats. Nicodemus asked, surely he, anyone, cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answers straight back, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh and the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. Yet you cannot be surprised at my saying, or maybe he should have said, you shouldn't be surprised at my saying. You must be born again. Because, you see, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is, ever, so, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus's jaw is on the floor. And he says... Some incredible words, very short. How can this be? First word that we're dealing with today, my friends, is energy. Energy is a, is a, a, a physics term. It, it's, it, it, it's a physical term as well. Uh, and, and, and if we had to just say two words like ener energy industry, I mean, all sorts of things would pop into your mind, but what I want to connect all of that to this morning is the Creator God. Can we do that? Because you see, this is Nicodemus looking for that energy. He's looking for the manifestation that was promised in Genesis 3. He's looking for the manifestation of this Creator God in the world, and it was said that He would be a man, and that he would come, and that we would see the face of God. Do you remember when Jesus said that uh, uh, the prophets had looked forward to this moment, and you get to have, disciples, you get to have the moment that the prophets really wanted? What did the prophets really want? What did Moses really want? Do you remember when he was up on the mountain? What did he really, really want? to see the face of God. And God said, no. Put him in the rock. Put his hand over him. But the disciples got to see, got to see the face of God. They got to see the Messiah. The one that was promised to come. The energy, the energy that is God in his, in his unknowableness that, that came and, and in, infused himself into humanity so that we might understand the almighty God in a way that had not to that point been understandable, even though he had revealed himself in powerful ways to his people. And he had always claimed to be the one who took them out of Egypt, the one who took them through the sea, the one who, who, who made water come out of the rock, the one who fed them manna for 40 years in the wilderness, the one that did all of these things, which seemed to be for 
nothing. Because they repeatedly decided, like their mother and father, Adam and Eve, like our mother and father, Adam and Eve, they repeatedly decided to turn away, to not believe. And as Isaiah says, to go their own way. Imagine, my friends, at these moments, you can imagine it corporately, you can imagine it personally. When we make these kinds of decisions, what does this do to the heart of God? I've got to believe that, that, it, that, that it, just, it just just hurts. It hurts. Jesus continues his, his interview with Nicodemus, and he is shocked at Nicodemus' lack of understanding and says so. He says, you are the Israel's teacher and, and you do not understand these things? Big, huge question mark. I tell you the truth. We, and I'm going to say that's the royal we, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen, but still you people... <laughs> That's politically incorrect, isn't it? However, <laughs> Jesus distances himself from this group, and he says, still, you people, you, you Pharisees, you Sadducees, you Sanhedrin, you, you people do not accept our Father, Son, Holy Spirit, believers' testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? You're asking me questions about heavenly things, Nicodemus, but you don't even believe the earthly manifestations of the power of God. I've got one thing to say to people who worship God, the God I know, on Sunday. Actually, two things. The first thing is, I love you. <laughs> I love you. And second thing is, you might want to get to know my God, the Creator God, and listen to what He says and listen to what comes out of His heart when He invites you to trust Him with your life and your health and your strength, and your future in the tiny, tiny window that we call this life. I was reminded of that this week as I looked at Nadia. She will have a funeral in this church on the 22nd of this month. Her nurse was so kind to wrap her face in the African way so that as she lay there in her bed that her mouth would not come open. Her troubles are over. She, she looked very peaceful, obviously, because there was nothing painful torturing her anymore in her life. But she leaves behind a family who is saying, no, 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 we wanted more time. 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 It's, it's fleeting. It's so short. When we think of eternity, and we, we, we desire, if you have a desire for eternity, Please understand how short this life is. 
And that really, <laughs> the only way to, to think about enjoying the relationships that you have right now, the people that you love right now, the only way that you can really, really enjoy that, coming up to Valentine's Day and all that, you know, is to say, I want to live with you forever. And I'm going to look for a way to do that. And, and, and what we're talking about today is, is the fact that the heart of God has been spilled out before humanity and he has said, here is the way that you can live forever. That's my creator God speaking to us. That's the God who said to Eve, there will come one. That's the one that, that, that Nicodemus was looking for that night. And that's the one that Jesus talks about when he talks about himself as God in the 16th verse of the third chapter of John. For God, he's going to lay it out now. You ready? Because this is word number two. Everybody, for God so loved the world, everybody, that he gave his one and only son, says the New International Version. You can say his, his beloved son, that whoever believes, there's the word. There's the, the separating action that will separate people in the end of time at the very judgment seat of God. Do you believe or not in him? Shall not perish, go away, disappear, be nothing, I like to say, be part of the group that chooses not life, but have eternal life. For God did not, this is 17 now, and we, we, don't, we, 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 know, we all know 16, but we should also grab a hold of 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but, that the, but to save the world, through, through him. So, um, I, I've got something for you today that, that just, well, it blew my mind, so I hope it blows yours. Okay? This is from the book that is being studied by uh, our Sabbath school class that meets in my office. It is called The Reason for God. It is by a really incredible guy named Tim Keller, who has a church in the heart of New York City, uh, that has four different places that it meets on the corners of Central Park. Keller says this, in his fantasy, understand that that's a, a uh, genre of literature, The Great Divorce. Who wrote The Great Divorce? Anyone? C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis describes a busload of people from hell. From hell. So they're taking tours. <laughs> That's the picture I want you to see. It's a tour bus coming out of hell who come to the outskirts of heaven. They are urged to leave behind the sins that have trapped them in hell. But they refuse. Lewis describes a description of these people uh, are striking because they, he, we recognize them uh, in, in self-delusion and self-absorption. We recognize uh, the small writing in, in our own addictions. Spent 45 minutes with a friend this week as she was describing living with her alcoholic husband. It basically came down to this. I told her, look, stay safe. When it is no longer safe, it's time to say goodbye. She's already kicked him out once, and she has taken him back as long as he's a good boy. But he's got places he can go, he's, uh, he's got other places he can stay, and I told her, as long as you are safe, take care of your children, love your husband the best you can, 
And we call him an addict, and he is. But, you know, as my mama taught me, uh, if the finger is pointing that way, there are three pointing back at me. And so I have to admit that there are things that, that C.S. Lewis is talking about that are in my heart, too. Here's what C.S. Lewis says. You ready? <laughs> Hell begins with a grumbling mood. Always complaining, always blaming others, but you are still distinct from it. You may even criticize it in yourself and wish that you could stop. He's talking about hell now. But there may come a day when you can no longer stop. Then there will be no you left. To criticize the mood or even enjoy it, but just the grumble itself going on further for forever like a machine. It is not a question of God sending us to hell. You ready for this? Nicodemus wasn't. In each of us there is something growing which will be hell unless it is nipped in the bud. What I have to, I mean, when I, when I read this, when I, when I heard this, because Chris and I were reading this together, what immediately jumped to my mind is Revelation 22, where Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me for everyone according to what they have done. In other words, according to what is in their heart. Remember, the word we're talking about here is everybody. And Jesus says, I've got a reward for everybody. And it is going to be according to what is in their heart. So God is, out of his heart, he is going to give you what is, in your, what is the deepest desire in your heart. That's what Revelation 22 says. That is exactly what C.S. Lewis is saying here. If, if, if there is a grumble in your heart, that is what you will be rewarded for. You will, be, you will be given what you want. Isn't that, is that not amazing to you? I think it's amazing because it basically says that if you choose the cage. Oh, I can't, I can't get ahead of myself. The people in hell are miserable, says, <laughs> says Keller. But Lewis shows us why. We see raging like unchecked flames, their pride, their paranoia, their self-pity, their certainty that everyone else is wrong. That everyone else is an idiot. All their humanity is gone and thus so is their sanity. I don't know about you, but I look out on the world today and I just am amazed that I am still sane. They are utterly, finally locked in a prison of their own self-centeredness. You know what jumps to mind in this very moment is Matthew 25, when Jesus says to the sheep, when I was in prison, you visited me. Keller is, is, is using Lewis here and is, is talking about the fact that as this busload from hell gets to the edges of heaven and is, is invited to let go of those things that have sent them to hell and, and enter into heaven, they say no because they're in a prison house of their own making. And then when you put Matthew 25 with that and you put Matthew 16 that says, in the power of the one who has established himself as the rock, the foundation of this church, in that power, we are to march into the hell of people's lives. And that hell will not be able to keep us out. That's what it says in 16. The gates of hell will not prevail. Crazy, huh? It's all Eric's fault. You picked this word, brother. Everybody, everybody, everybody has a choice. And the choices that you make make the environment in which your life exists. 
And those, those choices will one day be rewarded by the God of heaven who says, uh, welcome to heaven, or uh, I see that you really uh, wanted to go to hell. So, okay. You see how Lewis is, is not saying that it's God sending people to hell? It's themselves. They have decided that they would rather hold on to their own ideas. They would rather hold on to making themselves their own God and doing things their own way. Yes, thank you for singing that song for us. And uh, 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 they end up with the reward that is not life. Everybody. Everybody gets a reward. They continue to go to pieces forever, blaming everyone but themselves. Hell is that, says Keller, written large. That is why it is a travesty to picture God casting people into a pit who are crying, I'm sorry, let me out. The people on the bus from hell in Lewis's parable would rather have their freedom as they define it, than salvation. Their delusion is that if they glorified God, they would somehow lose power and freedom. But in a supreme and tragic irony, their choice has ruined their potential for greatness. Hell is, as Lewis says, the greatest Monument to human freedom. <laughs> Does that? I, I don't know. You, you're sitting there looking a little shell shocked. Good, good, because so was I. <laughs> Let me say that again. <laughs> the greatest monument to human freedom is hell. And if we are honest, when we look around, when we even look into our own hearts today, we will know the pain. We will be able to give testimony to the pain of the results of choosing our own way. I said we have to be honest. Okay? Because that's a really hard thing to do. Because we usually are not honest with ourselves. But if we're honest with ourselves, we'll realize that there are things in our lives, there are decisions that we're making that are making that, that prison. Romans chapter 124 says, this is the heart of God talking. You ready? God gave them up. You ready? God gave them up to their desires. So when you read John 3.16 about how God feels about the whole world, and then you read Revelation 22 that says He is going to have to honor your choice and my choice. In the end, He is going to honor that choice it's not what he wants to do if people walk away from him. It's not what he wants to have happen, but because he honors our choice, he is going to give us what we want. Lewis writes, there are only two kinds of people, those who say, thy will be done to God, or those whom God, in the end, says, are you ready? God says to some people, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose to be there. Without that self-choice, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. <laughs> Is that not a wonderful promise? 
If we seriously and constantly desire the joy, which, my friends, is a gift from God, we cannot manufacture it ourselves. It's a gift from God. Those of us who desire joy, instead of our own version of, of life in this fleeting moment, we will find it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lewis. Thank you so much for telling us that this is what the heart of God wants for everybody. Our last word is, is excellence. And in the last part of the interview with Nicodemus, Jesus says, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. The choices that you make, the results of those choices, it's, it's very embarrassing. And for many of us, it makes us very much not interested in going to God and saying sorry or going to God and saying, I know that you know this already, I admit that you know this, but I'm going to say sorry for it because now I'm giving it up. But I'm so glad for these tiny little juxtapositions. 21, but whoever lives in the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Are you with me today? Do you believe in righteousness by faith? Do you believe in life with God? Because my friends, everything that we've been talking about today from the heart of God to you today is this, that you cannot do what you know is what you need to do. But wait, there's more. There's an excellent plan. There's an excellent plan. You see, uh, for, for, for some, uh, they, they believe that the, the light is not the light. They believe that the darkness is the light. And actually, those are the most deluded of those who think about God and themselves. The delusion is pretty much complete when you get to the point where you believe that the darkness that we are experiencing in this world today is actually the light. Be very, very careful to check whether or not you are looking into the face of Jesus before you declare that you are in the light. Because there will come other messiahs. Jesus prophesied that. They will not be coming in the name of God. They will be coming in the name of their own God. I have to check on that. Believe me. I have to check that when I talk to you, I'm not talking to you uh, about my own idea of God. I'm talking to you about the idea that he tells me to tell you. So, so that, that happened to Paul, too, with the Bereans, remember? They, they went home after he preached, and they checked the Scriptures to make sure that what he said was what was in the Scriptures. So I invite you to check me out. If I say something that is not to do with the Scriptures, please let me know. Because it is my, my firm desire that the God that we talk about from this pulpit, the God that you hear about in this congregation, will only be the Creator God. And that He has come into this world as the light that lights the darkness. And that we would want to be in that light, that we would want to be near that light, is God's excellent plan. He designed it to help all humanity to know the heart of God. So in summation, we could say that God sends himself. His, his 
creative energy, if you want to think of God in, more of the, in, in, the, in the more abstract, okay, because I, my mentality certainly cannot encompass God. So he comes to us as himself, wrapped in human form, to give to all humanity, everybody, a true choice. A choice to, to choose the light over darkness. A choice to choose God over evil. The choice to choose heaven over hell. Then as an extension of his excellent plan, he empowers, are you ready for this? Because this is now me uh, sending you, okay? He empowers those who have chosen him to be their leader to, to charge down the gates of hell. The hell, my friends, that your friends, my friends, your family, and my family are living in right now. Okay, because if you're not living in heaven with Jesus, uh, the kingdom of heaven, which he proclaimed had, has already come, okay, if you're not living in that knowledge and in that belief right now, then you are already in a cage that is taking you to hell. So as you begin to see that from your own perspective, you are now beginning to see other people as God sees them. And when you do, you realize that he has already said in Matthew 16 that he will empower us, those who believe in him, he will empower us to charge down the gates that are keeping him out of other people's lives. He will empower us to go in and as a brand clutched and, and, and plucked from the burning, we will be able to help people out of hell. Now, now, okay? Not later. So if you want to feel something from the heart of God today, feel the urgency, the urgency that he has for the people who are in hell right now. And that he has, has, has ordained you, yes, use that word, it's the proper word, he has ordained you to go this week and, and, and to say the words that he has promised that he will give you into the lives of people in your circle who are in hell so that they can come out of hell and enjoy the kingdom of heaven with you. So the call, the call is really this. If you haven't believed, but you really do want to believe, then just let those things go. Get off that bus from hell and walk on in to heaven. The heaven that God has promised will be here. The heaven that I experienced this week when, when as a family we could, we could hold each other after Nadia's passing, and say, God, in the midst of this pain, please send us joy. And he did. He did. Because we remember the few nights before when, uh, with a shot of adrenaline <laughs> from her nurses, Nadia had started to sing in Russian and, and, and to remember all the good times. And they stood around the bed and they sang songs until she said, are you here still? <laughs> you should already be home. What amazing words to say to Adventists. Are you here still? You should already be home. Amen.